All righty, welcome back again for another wonderful conversation. Uh, this man probably needs no introduction anymore given the amount of times that I've had the chance to talk with him. Um, but, uh, well, actually this guy might need an introduction. He decided he wants to join this interview now since he's sick today. He gets uh, extra cuddle time. Uh, but uh, the person I'd like to bring on the screen with me, thank you, crew, yeah, you can say hello, he's, he's being the welcome host, is Kevin McGinnis, he's the man that ate McDonald's for 100 straight days and lost 60 pounds. He is a former bull rider. He has taken multiple companies public. He's helped train Oracle, Microsoft, Orbitz, you name it, helped them all with all their executive leadership programs. And he's been a great help, mentor, coach, everything along those lines for myself, hopefully crew here as well, as uh, we try to help people kind of unlock their financial success. And, in these, uh, and, and welcome, Kevin. How are you doing today? Dude, I'm doing really, really good. Thank you for having me on again. Always love having a conversation. Crew, good to see you. Wish you were feeling better, buddy, but good to see you. Yeah, Crew, you want to say anything to Matt? All right, good. He's contributing already. Um, so my goal today in this conversation is not just trying to gather information from you, Kevin, but also keeping this kid silent so he doesn't scream through our interview. Uh, but the show must go on, like they always say. Um, and so what I really wanted to be able to talk with you about today is really the, the lucrative advantages of being your own boss. Like there's a lot of financial advantages to that. And now there's a lot of people believe it's actually riskier to be an entrepreneur versus, you know, a standard business person. But I believe, you know, uh, and I, I know we'll probably get into this conversation, but a lot of people I know have all read Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad book and things like that. Uh, and that was one of the things that started me off on my own personal journey of trying to figure out whether it's better for me to be a, a corporate person or more of an entrepreneur. Um, but where would you want to kind of start today as you kind of help all of us, including crew here, better understand uh, the financial implications on the choices that we make? Yeah, it's a great question. And as far as the Rich Dad Poor Dad, yeah, that was one of the very first books that I read that got me into that mindset as well. And since you brought that up, I'll go ahead and share my screen out. We'll just talk about that, that mindset, but then also some other things that have just come along. Um, Yeah, so just the, the the quadrant that he called it, and you should see that on the screen now. Does that show up okay? Yep, we are all set. We are on the screen. You always got to check and make sure technology is working. I love technology when it works. We should <laughs> always do it. Um, so this morning, we even had a few of those challenges, but here we go. So four ways you can make money in this kind of, according to Robert Kiyosaki, there's four ways you can make money. Legal. There, there's other ways, but... Don't yeah, so let's, let's keep it all legal for the fact that this is streaming live to multiple platforms. Uh, we want to keep everything legal here. Legal, honest, and ethical ways to make money. That's what we're talking about here. So yep. when you look at it, there's the, the big four are you can make money as an employee, self-employed, business owner, or as an investor. As an employee, we're trading time for money. That's the clock on there. We're trading. Someone else controls your time. They tell you when you can work, when you can't. Someone else controls how much you're making, and you can go and try to get raises and promotions, and sometimes those happen and sometimes those don't, but you're trading hours for dollars. And one of the, the big frustrating things for me when I was an employee was I was a hard worker. I grew up on a ranch, breaking and training horses, so with the fences down at 2 o'clock in the morning and the cattle are getting out, you don't get to say, oh, I'll take care of it tomorrow. That's not my job. Those aren't my normal working hours. No, you get up, you round up the cattle, and you fix the fence. I mean, that's what you do. So I had that work ethic, and I was the, the first to get there, last to leave. And in some companies, that led to promotions and raises. And in some companies, it didn't because someone else controlled that. And I, I, I was going to put that work ethic in anyway. And sometimes, if, they, if I wasn't getting the raises or promotions, I had to vote with my feet right, and, and go to a different direction. But there was no guarantee that if I worked twice as hard, that I'd work make twice as much money. And a lot of people, there's when I ask them, what are some of the challenges that come along with being an employee? Having a boss, someone else can setting whether you can have a vacation or not, when you can have that vacation, somebody else asks for that time off, etc. So a lot of people get frustrated with that. They want to be a business owner, but they don't know how, so they become self-employed. And self-employed is anything where if you work twice as hard, you make twice as much money. So if you're a doctor and you help twice as many patients, you can make twice as much money. If you're a, a lawyer and I help twice as many clients, you can make twice as much money. If you're a real estate 
professional or a financial professional, you help twice as many people, you make twice as much money. The problem with being self-employed is if you take 90 days off, you make zero. No money coming in at that point. You've got, even yep. if you've got five or 10 employees, so a lot of people think they're a business owner because they've got five or 10 employees. The problem is, if you still can't take 90 days off, if the cat's away, the mice play, and the business shuts down because you're not there running it, if you're the chief cook and bottle washer, just because you have employees does not make you a business owner by this definition. The best definition I've ever heard of a true business owner is if you're a business owner, you can take 90 days off and you make the same money or more money than the day you left because the business runs whether you're there or not. Yeah, And I love that definition because that just helps really clarify. So most people that I know that call themselves business owners, a lot of my clients, when I first meet with them and have this conversation, that are, they, hey, I've got a DBA, I went down and did my filing, I've got my business name, all that stuff. So in their mind, they, they feel like a business owner and they, they are, they have a DBA, but they're not by that definition. They can't take 90 days off. And I just remember one of the my, my one of my first people that I helped in our business get over a half a million dollars a year in income. We were sitting on the beach in Costa Rica, and he looks at me and he says, "Thank you." I said, "Well, you're welcome, but but what for?" <laughs> he says, and I thought he was going to say because we're sitting on the beach in Costa Rica, and he says, "No," he says, "Happy wife, happy life." I'm like, I get it, but why are you saying that right now? He says, because. My, my wife is here with me. So I've been in other corporate jobs where I'd earn a trip and I'd go on the vacation, but the, the spouses weren't even allowed to come. It was a business trip. He says, here, I'm away from my business. My wife is here with me. We're making more money than I was ever making in corporate. And I, I just, I would literally just check my texts. I made $20,000 this week. While I'm sitting on the beach, I've never been in a business where I could be away from the business and have it run as well or better than when I was gone. I said, welcome to being a true business owner, because that's what it should be. If you own a McDonald's, you shouldn't be flipping McDonald's burgers in your own McDonald's. You go to Hamburger University to learn how to run your McDonald's, so your McDonald's will run. The drive through will run. You have a manager making sure that the shifts are getting covered, and you would be in Tahiti while your drive through is still making money. He says, I get it. I just want to thank you. I said, well, you're, you're welcome. And then finally, a investor, that's where your money is making money for you. So whether you were doing anything else, your money is earning interest and it's earning enough. So how do you define which one of these you're in? It's wherever at least 80% of your income is coming from. If 80% of your income is coming in as an employee, but you're doing some investing, you're not really an investor yet by this definition. Not until 80% or more of your income is coming in from one of those quadrants, that's when you get to shift into that next quadrant. So I just think that's a really healthy way to look at where are we really, but if a person had a choice of employed, self-employed, or business owner by those three definitions, when I ask that question, almost everyone says, well, I'd rather be a business owner if I truly could have a system that system runs the business, I run the system, the system runs the business, whether I'm there or not. And then my number one question I ask him is, well, why aren't you yet? What stopped you? What's held you back from being a business owner? And what do you think some of the answers are that when I ask that question? I mean, some of the answers are, well, I don't have the time to actually become a business owner, I would assume. Um, I don't have then I don't have the knowledge of how to be a business owner because I've just trained, been trained to be a doctor, just been trained to be a lawyer, just been trained, whatever it might be. So it's lack of knowledge, lack of time. Uh, and then I'd say maybe I don't have the confidence in it or the, the comfort level of, you know, we, we put ourselves in the boxes and we don't really believe that we can do things because we were, always taught like you can't succeed really <laughs> or there's a bigger like we all f uh, fear that we're going to be failures and so a lot of people yeah. don't want to take a chance on something that they could potentially not be good at absolutely and and that that risk aversion of my family's counting on me what if it doesn't work and i take this time away from my career that I, i'm building my my career and yep. i'm building my resume and it, it's so funny that so many times people say well i don't uh, you know, there's, there's this idea of being a business owner and, and you know, you're responsible for making sure the money comes in for your business. And, and I, I just want my safe, secure job. 
Oh, that job that laid you off during the last <laughs> downturn in the market, that, that yeah, safe, secure job that, re- and, and during COVID, it didn't work out so well. I just, th- this whole mindset of safe and secure jobs, job security used to be a thing. It used to be where someone would go to work for a company and they'd work for that same company for 30, 40 years, get the gold watch, Kool-Aid and cookie party, and they'd die of a heart attack two years later. I mean, that, that was really what it was. <laughs> and that job security... But when I ask people, hey, do you have experience, experience on the job? Used to be, oh, yeah, I've got 10 years experience. I've got 20 years experience at this job. Nowadays, when you ask that, people say, oh, yeah, I've got experience. I've had five different jobs. I'm 25 years old, and I've had five different jobs. Look at all the experience. They literally have shifted the meaning of experience. To look at my resume of how many jobs I've had, that shows that I have experience, where it used to always be you've been on the job, the same job for a long time, and it's yeah. So just the, the shift in cultural thinking has even changed. But let's talk about the need to be a business owner. Let's talk about some of the benefits and why somebody want to go this route, but also are there easy platforms? Because there's, there's basically four ways that you could be a business owner. Um, you could, because um, we're going to talk about there's four types of businesses. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, you could do a startup. So challenge with a startup is it's in your garage, you're, you're coming up with some problem and you're coming up with some solution to that problem and you've got to be super creative and then you've got to rally a team around your vision and how are you going to get this off the ground? Where are you going to bootstrap the money for to, to get this idea? And sure. the reality is only 5% of startups ever make it. Yeah. 95% of all startups fail. So that's where that risk, huge risk comes in and that's where a lot of people just like, I'm not, I'm not going to risk my family's future by doing a startup on my own out of my garage. Now, yep. of course, there's success stories like the Bill Gates of the world who did that and they made it work. But again, it's 5%, 95% now. So that's where the next level, so that's number two, is franchises. So franchises, they've eliminated a lot of the risk. They've made a turnkey solution. So when a person buys the franchise, they're not buying the ability to go flip McDonald's hamburgers. They're buying a turnkey system. They're going to Hamburger University to learn how to run that franchise, yep. hiring staff to run it, and they can be remote, and that business will still run. The problem is with that, on the low end, $500,000, million, $2 million, you're going to get something that's so proven like a McDonald's that you know you're yep. going to make $150,000, 200000 a year, but you're going to have a 10-year ROI. You're going to 10 years before you get that million dollars back. You're making yep. $200,000 and it costs you $2 million to buy it. Even if you've got funding, someone else loans you the money, whatever, it's still 10 years before you're profitable. You're yep. still paying back that $2 million. The next one, though, would be a platform. Getting into a platform. And as a platform, that's um, anything that, for example, your, your, your network marketing companies, your multi-level marketing companies. And... The challenge there, obviously, is you've got to be really, really careful. There's a thousand soap, lotion, potion companies out there that, right, that all promise the, you know, the world. But if you don't have 10 who get 10 who get 10 who get 10, right, if you don't have 10,000 people in your team, all, you know, if, I, if I'm selling this, this mug for yeah. $5, eh, I don't care how I don't care how good a salesperson am. I personally can't sell enough of these yep. to make enough money to feed my family. But if I have ten thousand people and I'm making a dollar per mug sold, well then maybe five years from now, ten years from now, it goes back to that ten year ROI, the ten year yeah. return before I ever get to that point that maybe I make it at that point, if that company is even still around. Because a lot of those obviously are flash in the pans and do they last. Sure. So if you're gonna choose the platform out, you've got to choose the right platform. Yep. But also, in, in that platform, it's got to be profitable enough personally. I want to know that I could go make six figures, over $100,000 a year, on my own pen. If I, if I have a platform that I can go make six figures on my own pen, and I can help others do that, well, I don't need a huge team at that point. I, I can make it whether, whether I have an, a team or not, but I already have this proven platform, and the barrier to entry is in many cases a couple hundred bucks, maybe a thousand bucks or less to be able to plug into a platform that's already built, contracts are already in place, everything's there. And now I'm a business owner in a platform that I have the ability. And this is kind of what you see when people are doing the TikTok shops and different things. They're actually creating that self-employed 
Yeah. And they're hoping to get to a point where they have enough videos out there where they have some passive income coming in. But a lot of them get caught in they've got to keep creating that content. Otherwise, yeah. that revenue stream just goes away, goes back to that self employed model. And then finally, again, the worst, the worst, worst one of all is just being an employee. You're, you're building someone else's business owner business, right? If we're an employee yeah. working, for, and don't get me wrong, if you're going to be an employee, be the best employee. Yeah, I always wanted to be the best at what I was doing. And I, so I was a really, really good employee, but I was really building someone else's business. So being able to start something on the side, so you, A, it used to be a luxury to have a business. It used to be a nice to have to have an extra income. With inflation and the economy the way it is now, for so many families, it's mandatory. You have to find a secondary source of income. Your primary source of income in many cases is not going to make it. The person's yeah. not going to have enough money to make, meet their bills and be able to start saving and investing for the future. So what are they going to do for retirement? How are they going to get their kids through college? How are they going to be able to upgrade their standard of living at some point if they don't have an additional revenue stream, if they don't have an additional income? And you and I yeah. talk about one time about revenue streams, right? About business owners. So talk, refresh my memory on what you said about business owners and revenue streams. Yeah, I think it was like a Robert Robert G. Allen book. Uh, he's one of those guys that wrote a ton of like millionaire mindset type books. And I think he said the average millionaire has about seven different revenue streams. Um, and I mean, that kind of makes sense. What you were just touching on now with inflation, I, I mean, how everybody's getting crushed by interest rates, inflation, insurance costs. Um, we've also become a he heavily lit litigious, lit litigious society, however I'd probably say that, but people are getting sued <laughs> left and right. Um, right. So like everything is just more expensive to live and breathe air now. Um, and uh, working at your corporate job is still a, grill, a really nice safety net and fantastic but it may not still be able to make all the ends meet or it makes ends meet, but doesn't get you to that next level of living a really fulfilling life that you're, you know, idealistically looking for. Um, well, I, I, I ask people all the time, do you, are you where you want to be financially? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, well, how much money did you make? What's your best year? In the last 10 years, what's your best year? And they'll be like, oh, I made a hundred thousand, I made 150, made 500,000. You know, it doesn't matter what the number yep. is, made 50,000. It doesn't matter, you know, we, we help people in all different levels mm -hmm. of income, no family left behind. But no matter what the number is, I say, well, if you made a hundred thousand dollars last year, let's say you made that for the last 10 years, that's a million dollars you made. How much of it do you have left? Yeah. And the average person's like, well, None or maybe 10% or 20%, right? Uh, if we don't make a change, if we don't do something different, what's the next 10 years going to look like? Yeah. And, they, and they, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I see where you're going with this. But then it comes down to it's not a go make more money at your job because how can you double your income? How could you go if you make $100,000 at your job? What could you possibly do at your job? to get you to 200,000. How could you double your income at your job? And for most people, there's like, like there's no way there, there's nothing I could possibly do to double my income. Yep. So working harder at that job and look at people who are 10, 15, 20 years down the road from you in your job. I knew that no one was going to tap me on the shoulder and move me into the CEO's role. They weren't going to fire the CEO and make me the CEO of the company. I might go from a manager to a senior manager. Yep maybe into an executive role, maybe if I was lucky, the 10th grade education, it wasn't likely, it actually did happen twice, but it was surprising for everyone when it did. Yeah. Um, but but, that, but that, once I got to that VP level, even as a, as a vice president, I was still only making about 150 with some bonuses, 200,000 a year. They were never gonna tap me on the shoulder and put me into the CEO role. So I kind of, I, I hit the glass ceiling, I hit that ceiling of there was, there was no more room there yeah. was no way I could double my income from 150 to 300,000. Physically impossible. I would never, ever have done that. But being able to start a business on the side, getting all the tax benefits that go along with being a business owner just made, mm -hmm. made all of a sudden gave me more spendable income. But then as my income increased on the side, it eventually got to the point where I was making more money part time than I was full time. And it was very easy to make that transition because my wife is very security oriented. She likes to have all her ducks in a row. Yeah. So that's where choosing the right platform comes into play because I was able to actually outpace my income at my J-O-B, my just over broke, my yeah. jail operating as a business, my jump off a bridge, 
right? <laughs> All the acronyms <laughs> that go along with that. Because <laughs> the warden tells you when you can take your break, when you can have coffee, when you can go on vacation. The warden tells you. They call it salary, sometimes slavery. I don't know if those two things rhyme for a reason, but anyway, sure. hey, there's the ability to actually have that additional income. So most people for their financial future, it's not that they're not working hard. They're working hard, yeah. but even working twice as hard as they're working now is not going to give them that extra income at their job. So why not take their spare time and turn their spare time into an actual business that gives them passive income? So if something ever happens to their current income stream, no problem. They're, they're back where they were, but they also have the ability to double up, triple up, quadruple up. They have no limit. There's no ceiling on that income. So, so you make a really good point here, Kevin. Um, and I think about my days when you know I spent time at P&G and Berkshire Hathaway and then Nike. And I will tell you, in my earlier years of corporate, all I did was corporate work. Like that's all I was focused on. I didn't really think about too many things, too entrepreneurial. I, I had some things I dipped my toes in, but is more ideation, nothing pursuing. Um, and then I will say, and I would say I wanted to be CEO. Like you would ask my parents ideally what I wanted to be at that point in time at P&G when I just started as a manager, I wanted to be Bob McDonald, who was our CEO at that time. Like that takes 30 some years and yep. each level you go up gets more competitive. So there's only going to be one CEO and P&G has tens of thousands of employees worldwide. So the likelihood of me actually getting to that stage, one, it would probably take 35 years. And two, by the time I would get there in 35 years, the amount of money I would lose by not per creating more multiple streams of revenue to make the same amount as the CEO who's going to be getting $10 million a year in 35 years. Like that's where I started to wake up because I will tell you, I was definitely much more competitive with my coworkers earlier on. And then once I started realizing that I could make other streams of revenue, possible where I started with real estate. So I, was a, I started as a passive real estate investor and then I was an active real estate investor. And when I started recognizing that I could get just as much money off of my current W2 job with my um, revenue streams that are passive, I started actually becoming a more collaborative worker, which actually helped me and helped my teammates more. And so yeah. even if you wanted to stay at a job, you could actually relieve a lot of tension and anxiety by creating a second stream, a third stream of income. So like a lot of the times I don't actually want people to leave their jobs because I think also jobs just creates sanity for a lot of people just to get out of the house. If they have a crying kid and things like that. Um, so, and if you like what you're doing, then, then, then don't leave what you're doing, but just try and find something that in my opinion can relieve uh, like melody, like security. Right. So, um, if, if your W-2 job can give you that security and these other streams of income can take you above security to, you know, abundance, then, then why not use both? It doesn't have to be either or here. Correct. I love that. And so just to piggyback off of that, I'm going to share my screen one more time here. Yeah. So... This just is uh, in our business and financial service, financial services just happens to be one of the highest paid industries in the world. Um, when you look at the average compensation of doctors on the right hand side, so you've got everyone from emergency medicine down there at $300,000 a year up to neurosurgery at $600,000 a year. As you look at those compensations, how long wow. does that person have to go to school? to be able to get into a position and then get through residency and then finally be able to actually be the doctor or the surgeon. What, what do you think the average time to that revenue is? Huh. Uh, I mean, what is it? Medical school is seven years, right? Then you right. do a fellowship and then probably a few more years of that. Let's just say a decade at least um, yeah, to get to that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Of advanced training after getting through school, going to college, all the additional, at least a decade. In oh, and that doesn't even include probably the student debts that you're paying for medical yeah. school. Yeah. So, so, so there, there's time and then there's the cost. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Time. Um, and many of these people aren't business owners at that point. They're, they're, they're not running their own practice. It's funny, they, in medical school, they don't teach you how to, be a, how to run a medical practice. They teach you how to be a doctor in somebody else's medical practice. Yeah, you have yep. to actually figure out how to run your own practice separately. I mean, you, 
Like, I, I don't know about you, but if I had a choice of being the specialist or being the doctor that owns the medical practice that has a bunch of specialists working in that practice, mm-hmm. again, it goes back to that business owner mindset. Um, great book called E-Myth, um, The Entrepreneur Myth. And for a lot of people, they're great at their trade. They're great at their craft. They're really – so they're a table maker. And they're like, I'm a – I'm this phenomenal table maker. I make these beautiful artesian tables out of these amazing quality woods and different things from around the world. And then they decide to be a business owner. And they try and make the shift from being a craftsperson, craftsman or craftswoman, and they try to make that shift to being a business owner. And they fail because making great tables doesn't make you a great business owner. Yeah. There's, there's no training, coaching, mentoring of how to run a successful business. How do you handle the scale, the growth, the expansion, all the things that happen when yeah. you make that shift? And so many people in the medical profession, for example, just stay as a doctor working in someone else's medical practice. Yeah. But if you look at the people on the left, these are all people that work in our financial services. And this isn't the whole company. It's just a small snapshot of just the leadership team that I'm a part of. And as you look at all the incomes on that page, the people on this page went got a license from their state to be able to talk about financial education. That licensing process, on average, for each of these people, took two weeks. Okay. Now, they got their license within two weeks. Now, that doesn't mean they're fully trained in making that money within the first two weeks. Then, the, the, again, being part of a platform that has training on it, within their first two years, though, first two years in the business, they're making – a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year within their, in most cases, in the examples on the page, they were making that money in their first couple of years in the business. For me, within the first two years, so 10 years ago, I didn't have a license. Two years later, Mm -hmm. I had my licenses and I had a business that the passive income alone was over two hundred thousand dollars, which was about, it was a little bit more than what I was making in corporate America. So it took me 25 years in corporate America to get to where I was making almost 200,000 a year. It took me two years in the right platform to get to where I was making 200,000, but that was passive whether I got out of bed or not versus the rug would be pulled off my reefing. When I would take a company public within six months, the board would bring in a new CEO and they bring, you know, because they'd run a public company, running a private company and a public company are two different animals. So they bring in a new CEO and that new CEO would bring their entourage with them, their VPs and senior VPs from previous companies. So me, the founder, chief revenue officer, chief marketing officer would all be let go to make room for that new leadership team. Well, how is that security? There is, there is no job security. I don't care what level you're at in the company, the rug can get pulled out from underneath you. And I used to have that conversation with people and some people were like, yeah, maybe. After COVID, everyone's like, yep. I don't care how much you love your job or how much you, your job loves you. You could literally lose it in a heartbeat. Yeah. So being able to have some sort of safety net, something that can actually replace your income and then have no cap or no ceiling on it, just, I, I just highly recommend that people at least look at being able to have something outside of just yeah. their J-O-B. Yeah. I mean, okay. So – So I hear these parts and let me read these things back of things that I've gathered thus far. So we've got, um, if you wanted to kind of be your own business owner and and take advantage of some of those tax advantages, you could go the startup route, uh, which we know those are kind of like the, the rocket ships, um, you know, only 5% really excel, 95% completely fail. And so that, that is an actual risk and that's true. Um, you can go down the franchising model. I've personally gotten down the franchising model. I've gone the, the startup route. I've, I've done a lot of these options um, in right. franchising. Uh, and in that one, uh, you're, you're betting on the jockey, not the horse. Um, and you want to make sure it's a good jockey. Um, if not, then you've, you've, uh, uh, you might, might want to figure out a solution. <laughs> um, and then there's the platform basis, which, yeah, you've talked like, multi-level marketing organizations, which is only thousands or only so many thousands of soaps and lotions you can sell. And that's not a business I want to be in either because uh, that's not sustainable. Uh, that it's, it's just calling for cannibalization and it, it almost feels truthfully like a pyramid scheme. And, and so. And, and truly the only, the people who got in earlier, if, if, if you look at the only people making money are the ones who got in a lot earlier, then and I'm not going to get to where they are versus like for example in, in financial education what we do we borrowed one thing 
from the network marketing companies. The yeah. one thing that we borrowed was the fact that they have high energy. The, the trainings, the coaching, the, the motivation yeah. is high. But if they have to pay you with motivation because they can't pay you financially for five or ten years. So they literally – turns out, though, people will do more for an emotional reward than they will a financial one. Someone will throw themselves in front of a bus for their kid, but they wouldn't for a paycheck. So people will do more for an emotional payoff than they will a financial one. So we said, let's keep the high energy. Let's keep the training, the motivation, the speakers. But let's pay people really well also. Let's make sure we don't have that. And I've got people that I've trained, coached, and mentored that came in after me that are making more money than me. I have three people that are over $800,000, about to go over a million dollars a year in income. I'm at seven fifty. dollars They're making more than I am. Because yeah. like a franchise model, if I, if I own five McDonald's but you own 10 McDonald's, it doesn't matter when we got our McDonald's you're going to make more money because you own 10 McDonald's and I only own five McDonald's. So we took a hybrid approach between the franchise and the platform. But luckily our firm, the egg on our parent company was so big, they didn't need a franchise fee. We don't need the million dollar franchise fee. We want more distribution. We want dissemination of information. We want to get the education out there to change families' lives. So we, we, we just we made ourselves a hybrid between that platform and franchise. Yeah, so it, there's something else I, I want to think about before I circle back to that, because I just Googled it while we were talking here. And uh, we were talking about, you know, the multi-level marketing organizations, and it's only the people at the top. This is going to be, uh, this might trigger some people, but corporations are pretty much like multi-level marketing organizations. I just Googled it. In 2022, the most recent uh, reporting we have is CEOs made 344 times as much as the typical worker. So you that, can't ever have their position. <laughs> so, so, I mean, uh, that right there, whether you want to call your corporation MLM or not, um, you're not getting the same amount of pay as your CEO. That's a guarantee. Um, and you are yeah. working to make that CEO more money. Um, so, yeah. And they provided you an environment. So here, so is there, a, is there a justification for working that job? Sure. You, they, you didn't have the overhead. You didn't have the cost. You didn't have the expense. They deserve to make some money and now do they all i'm not i mean it might trigger some people by saying they deserve but the reality is if that person's running an organization and growing that organization they're making profit for that organization they're creating yeah. jobs for people that have the positions and they're as profit comes in part of that is paying your salary you're you're giving up the ability to have excess income but you're getting that at least i'm making this much in this role and i'm choosing yeah. to trade my time for those dollars but I didn't have to have an, an outlay of buying a building and paying the rent and paying the heating and the air conditioning and all that. So again, use a job like you said, use a job to do what it's good for, covering the essentials, covering the, 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 the let's at least make sure our bills are covered. And then let's make sure we have something else we can do that can start stacking the excess. And once we're making more outside of that than we are, then we have some choices. We can keep when we're doing our job, or if we're making more outside of that, we have revenue streams where we're making more than what we're making at our job, and we know that those are steady and growing, then we can make a determination of do we want to keep trading these hours for these dollars or will those hours be better spent or to stop doing those hours altogether because I'm making as much as I was at my job. So you either get a nice lifestyle back yep. or you decide to continue to grow it at that point, but you have those choices. And that's, I just want people to have the choice. I want you to have something that gives you the ability because if you have, you said it great, when you have the extra income, you're a better employee because you can give your honest opinion. Someone who doesn't have excess savings or excess revenue are at risk of giving their opinion to, at their job. Because if they say what they really think, in many cases, they're worried they might get fired. So what do they do? They try to toe the company line or say what they think people want to hear in different meetings because they don't have any savings. They can't risk their job and their spouse or significant others counting on them versus someone who has the safety net, has the extra income. They can be a true benefit to the company by saying, that's wrong. What you're about to do isn't good. We should be doing this instead of that. And if you fire me, oh, well, but I'm not, I'm, I'm able to give my honest feedback, my honest opinion. Now, I try to do that regardless. And if I got let go, I would go find another position. But so many people, they've done studies on it where they literally try to fly under the radar because they don't have a safety net. They don't have, they, so they can't even be the best worker they could be at their job because they don't have that safety. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I completely agree with you there. Sorry, I was getting a little distracted with Crew uh, throwing his milk around over here. Um, but I mean, so so talk to me a bit on like the platform because some things that stuck out to me here. I was thinking about like Uber. People that so long as they had a car, they were able to actually now turn their car into a, a profit generating engine. Um, and even buying a car is kind of an expensive thing in order to actually start turning a profit on it. Um, you already had the car, so that, there, there's no new expense. You already had a car yeah. and a car payment. If you turn the, if you turn the existing expense into an asset, that, that's yeah. one of the smartest things a person can do, right? If, find a way to take what you're already doing. And find, it's like getting a tax write-off. So when you're a business owner, you get all these tax write-offs. So your cell phone, your internet, your mileage, your lunches, your dinners, just mileage alone, 65 cents a mile, you drive 10,000 miles a year, that's $6,500. The average employee doesn't have that they're, they're literally stepping over that, that between that lunches and dinners it comes to about $10,000 in tax deductions for most people. Well, I'm sorry, is your back okay? If there's $10,000 laying on the ground, can you figure out a way to pick up that 10 grand? Yeah, right. Yeah. So having a business, and one of the cool things about our platform is we allow someone to start part-time without risking their job. They get a license, which costs them about $300, but they get $10,000 in tax deductions the first year alone. The tax code was written for you to be a business owner. Yeah. In, back in the day, right, when, when this country was founded, think about it. Almost everyone was a business owner. You were the, the blacksmith or the barber or you owned the general store, right? The, yeah. the, the vast majority of people were business owners. So when they started writing the tax codes, the tax codes were written for you to be a business owner. Then when industrialization came along, they're like, hey, let's send everyone to school and teach them how to be a good little employee, <laughs> how to come work in the factories and manufacturing and in the, in the industry. So all of a sudden you have this school system that tells you to show up at eight o'clock or nine o'clock, so tells you to take a lunch at this time, turn in your book report at this time, and yeah. it makes you a really good employee. In fact, if you look up studies on valedictorians, you go to search on YouTube, valedictorians that are business owners, they aren't. Like There's less than like three percent are yeah. valedictorians ever go on to own a business because being a valedictorian means you're a really good student, which means you're a really good employee. I'm not saying you can't as a valedictorian yeah. go become a business owner. It's just your odds are not in your favor. Correct. To quote the whole mocking Jay. Right? Yeah. May the odds ever be in your favor? Yeah, the odds are not in your favor of you being <laughs> anything but an employee yeah. if you go down that route. Um, you can break out of that mold. But you're like it's a you know twelve years of you in just putting yourself inside that mold. Yeah. You do that. Most business owners are C students, and it comes down to it that their, their ability to actually think outside the box, be creative, take on challenges, do whatever it takes to get the job done when it needs to be sure. done. I mean, it's just a different mindset, and that's a muscle that anyone can build. But how do you build that muscle? while you still have to provide for your family. And that's where you having something you can do outside of that while you still have that security net, have something you can start part-time that you can then build, and yeah. then you can make that transition. I don't know if that answered the question. I, don't, I think we might have got off on a tangent there. No, I mean, hey, I love tangents though. This is the best part of these conversations. Um, I mean, so for me, if I think about this, because I know I talk with a lot of business owners um, and the business owners ideally want to keep their businesses open. So they don't necessarily want to steer their attention and time right. away from making sure their business stays open because they have employees right. that they're taking care of. They have families they're taking care of. Right. Ideally, we want to ensure that these businesses are able to sustainably stay open, which means the business owners have to be able to sustainably make money. And Let's assume that that business is already making good money, but you're going to have inherent cost climbing. And just as you were touching on earlier in the conversation, you, you ask somebody that's making $200,000 a year if that's enough, and they say, no, they need like 250, or if they're making 500, they need 600, whatever it might be. And so you say to these business owners, hey, here's another revenue stream available for you. And I know with how like WFG's process is set up and, and transparently, I am a member of WFG. I've gotten my license. I am a passive partner person in this. I can pass people over to you and you can run away with them and, 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 uh, or not run away with them, but, uh, you can get them run set them. up run, and run I with them, help them and you get compensated as we help them. Absolutely. E exactly. And so that's where I think could be the value for any business owners that watch this is recognizing, Hey, one, it's 100% legal because 
how you actually have to get uh, the <laughs> license, license set up. So it's not you like one of these. Have a license you to do illegal things. That does. Yeah. So it's not one of those scammy things that you see on an MLM. So that that's one thing that stuck out to me uh, because and there's too many damn scammers. Five year old company. So 175 years. Yeah. If the, if in the financial industry, which is the highest regulated industry in the world, if after 175 years, the company was doing things wrong. They would have been shut down a long time. Ago. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, Honest, so that, that's big. Yes. Yeah. All right, so that gives me greater certainty then. And then two, you know, you're actually helping your people that you're referencing. It's not like they're getting upsold on something. And, and I know you've told me this before. The client will never be paying you, Kevin, directly. The client will be making an investment in their future, whatever it might be with a respective company and then that company determines how much you get paid from it correct out of their marketing dollars never the client's money so if you have yeah. a wells fargo account that was paying you a tenth of a percent and you got a nationwide account paying you 10 15 20 percent it's still your money in your account you didn't give anything to us we're just the platform connecting that person who has a car with somebody who's ride like uber we're connecting someone who has a financial goal with the right financial yeah. companies and then those companies have marketing dollars for Super Bowl ads and click marketing. They yeah. pay us out of those marketing dollars, never the client's money. So the client's money goes into the client's account. You're absolutely correct. Okay. So, all right, then, then I'm feeling pretty good about this because, one, we confirmed it's not a scam. Two, it's very uh, uh, reliable given it's 175 years. It's a highly regulated industry. I'm going to try and talk over a crying kid here now. Um, Ooh, you're, you're, you're so good, buddy. We're so proud of you, man. Yeah, you he's, he's holding on. We've only got a few minutes left, I think, on this one. And I'll, 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 because of what you're doing right now, think about this. As a business owner, being able to have your own time, stay home with your kid and not get fired, right? I mean, how yep. cool is that? Yep. And that people understand that, hey, things happen. And you're able to have a conversation about financial education with a baby in your arms. How cool is that that we actually have that option? Or we have the option to say, you know what, let's bump this meeting till later. You, the fact that we have complete control of our time, if I've got a job, I want to build an income stream that gives me that freedom, that gives me that ability to have complete control of my financial future, but also complete control of my schedule. Yeah, that, that's, that's right on the money there. So I, I guess uh, since th this kid is going to probably scream his head off here in a second, um, <laughs> I, I don't want people we'll to have to this one up, that. We'll, have, we'll, we'll, we'll reconvene. And there's a couple other thoughts we can go over next time. But as yeah. always, I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate well, having these conversations with you. Yeah, so, so I guess if we close this out, though, Kevin, what would you say is like the next one major step somebody wants to do? If they want to get involved in this, I, I assume there's a, 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 like a process for getting a, a, a license, a process for even getting accepted by WFG, because they're not going to just take every single person that wants this. I, I assume there's some kind of prerequisites, requirements on how you can essentially establish your own business underneath uh, Transamerica's umbrella. Correct. If you want to put your mute on, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, crew. Um, yeah, I know that super simple with us. Yes, there is a background check. We have to make sure someone is who they say they are. But I, we have so many business owners who once we help them as a client, we make sure they have executive bonus plans. We have structures in place to make sure that they're able to actually get money off of the bottom line of their business already into accounts that have the high returns, no risk. So once they become a client or we've just set up their kids' college funds or their own personal financial plans, they give us referrals. And one of the conversations we have with them is, hey, on these referrals, you, you, you know that you got help. You know that when we go see these referrals, we're going to end up helping them. Do you want me to get paid or do you want we? To get paid and they're like well what's that what's that look like to your point earlier they get to keep their blinders on keep focus on their job or their business but stick their toe in the water get a license get go through a background check with the company make sure that they don't have you know felonies perjury if you've been robbing banks you're not going to get licensed in the financial industry it's not going to happen seems like uh, a reasonable so, requirement yeah. yeah you know minor detail <laughs> i never thought i'd walk into a bank with a mask on but then in COVID, I, it just felt weird to be able to walk into a bank with your face covered. But anyway, yep. that's back to what we're talking about. Um, so anyway, the ability to, to get the background check done, so just they literally can reach out to you or you can forward them on to us. We're more than happy to have that conversation of walking through what that looks like. Getting a license from the state, it's about $300. $300 to get a license, about part-time around your schedule. It takes less than two weeks. Yeah. Fastest is two days for me on average. 
it was about two weeks for someone with a busy schedule, with family, work responsibilities, everything else. Just part time, they get to go online, do a little bit of studying, learn the information. So you have these practice exams that teach you how to pass the actual state exam. Yeah. And then you need a C minus minus. You need a 70% on the state exam. So if you hate taking tests, welcome home. You'll be just fine. Um, multiple guest tests. You've got to see the answers in advance. You need the C minus minus to actually get past it. Yeah. But just like getting your driver's license doesn't make you a good driver. You've probably seen people who have a driver's license who are not good drivers. Oh, yeah. Passing, <laughs> passing your written exam does not make you a good driver. Getting your license doesn't necessarily make you good at financial services, but it lets you know the rules of the road, lets you know what you can say, what you can't say. Then you become a good driver when you get your learner's permit and you have someone sitting next to you, coaching you and training you, if you have a good coach. And some of us had yeah. good coaches and some of us did not have good coaches, right? Pick your favorite race car driver. If they were your coach, you would be a better driver than if your dad who got frustrated and yelled at you and you're trying to learn to drive a stick shift on a hill and rolling backwards and popping the clutch, right? And he's losing his mind while you're backing into cars behind you. That may not be the greatest learning experience for some people learning how to drive a stick yeah, shift. Yeah, probably not advisable, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. So what you want is you want a good coach sitting next to you. So in our model, in our model, when someone starts part-time, our training consists of going through the online training, but then also hands-on training where we're there with them, holding their hand, making sure that someone is showing them how to do it and then coaching them while they do it so we can pass that skill set on. Because not yeah. just the rules of the road, you want to know how to actually help these people, but the software does the heavy lifting on the financial planning. I yeah. was a professional bull rider. I got kicked in the head a lot. You don't want me doing math. <laughs> that is not my forte. But... I can plug someone's situation, their goals, their desire, when they want to retire, kids through college, into the software. The software can come up with the, the actual math on it. And then those companies, we have 100 different companies that have CFPs, certified financial professionals, people with their PhDs in money. They're the chef in the kitchen. When someone's with us, when they start part time or even when they go full time, they don't have to be the financial guru. We have the financial gurus. Yeah. We need people to actually just open the door for the conversation. Because in financial services, just like the medical practice, you have to diagnose before you prescribe. Sure. So when someone is with us, they're able to actually identify what's your goal, when do you want to retire, you know, do you want your money set aside for your son for college or for you know, buying a house, or just identifying those goals. And then that information goes in and the chefs in the kitchen come back with their plan, then yeah. we're able to serve that plan up. So if a person's like, oh, I could never be in financial services because I don't know money and I don't really like math, Dude, uh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Being able to, being able to help, uh, having a heart for helping others, and you're going to get referrals anyway. Why not let somebody else help that referral, and you get half the compensation? Fifty percent of everything we pay out as a company, we pay to the referral agent or affiliate broker side of the equation. Mm -hmm. We paid out 1.3 billion with a B, 1.3 wow. billion to our agents last year. About half of that went to our affiliate brokers, our referral agents, people who are sticking their toe in the water part-time, wow. referring someone else in. We give 50%, half of the compensation we pay out to the person who referred the business in. The industry hates us for this, by the way. They're like, why don't you give them a gift card to Panera? Um, I don't know. Because without that person, we wouldn't have met that person, the, the person they referred. They deserve the compensation. We had a guy that worked at Southwest Airlines, baggage handling. Heard through the grapevine, Southwest was thinking of redoing their 401k plan. Worked part-time with us, full-time at Southwest Airlines. Yeah. He doesn't know how to do a 401k for a major company. Yeah. He doesn't know how to pick up a telephone and say, help. <laughs> we fly out the experts. They use our $500 billion in assets to negotiate a better deal. Southwest Airlines now uses Transamerica for their 401ks. The referral agent, the guy who was part-time with us, makes $300,000 a year, whether he gets out of bed or not. He doesn't sling bags at Southwest. <laughs> he was able to make that shift. Um, and now he literally makes over a million dollars a year with our firm because he didn't stop. Right? He's like, hey, if I was able to help one company, I could probably help some other people as well. Certainly. But that just gives you an example of how we let, we let someone stick their toe in the water. Yeah. We're going to give referrals anyway. Why not get an extra revenue stream from that? Why not get the tax write-offs of being a business owner? And then once you're making more money, you can make some new decisions. Yeah.
No, I mean, that's huge on that Southwest <laughs> Airlines guy. Um, that's incredible. And that just also shows that um, there's a lot of untapped potential in the marketplace. Um, there's there's billions of people in the world that need help. Well, just to, like I live in Nashville. There's yeah. 3 million people. And when you think in Murfreesboro, Smyrna, Spring Hill, the surrounding areas, there's yeah. 3 million people in the greater Nashville area. I could have 10,000 licensed agents here in Nashville tomorrow. Top 10% are getting a financial education from the Charles Schwab's Merrill Lynch. Yeah. 90% do no financial education. You understand with 10,000 licensed agents, I can't even make a dent in Nashville. Just yeah. not, not the whole country right now. We obviously are throughout all of US, Canada, Puerto Rico. Yeah. But there's such a, it's not a hard problem. Solving someone's financial problems is super easy. The tools are super simple. It just yeah. requires an explanation. People don't know what they don't know. So yeah. here's the analogy I use on the problem. If, if, if I gave you a shoebox full of marbles, and gave you a, a little container of turtle wax, and I said, yeah. your job is to polish these marbles. So over the next couple nights while you're you know playing through, while you're watching TV, right, just polish the marbles. In a couple nights, you'd, you'd have the job done. Right? It's not a yeah. hard job. It's just a little time to get it done. That's what this financial education is. It's not a hard job. We're just explaining some concepts and laying it side by side. If people just didn't know what they didn't know. And once they see it side by side, they're like, hey, I'd rather have the better one. The problem is it's not a shoebox full of marbles. Mm -hmm. It's the Grand Canyon full of marbles. Yeah. The need is so huge that why we created this hybrid model was because we, our problem is not finding, the problem isn't how do we find more clients. Our problem is how do we get people licensed fast enough to handle the needs of all the clients that are referred into our business. Of the two problems, that's a better problem to have. By the way. Yeah, I would say that's a better problem to have. Um, but I, I also like that this one is, is truthfully out to help people. So to why I started my mental health company, my, my mission was to touch and improve the lives of people in my community. And mental health, uh, both Republicans and Democrats agree, mental health is a major issue. Uh, so you don't have to be on a political party to determine that mental health is a major issue. And that's why I wanted to get involved in that field. In the same way with financial mental health is a problem with politics. Oh, I'm sorry. I got <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, and it's the same thing with financial services. I think what's the stat? Only like 25% of people have financial advisors or, or something like that. Or is that even that's overstated? Yeah, yeah that, that's overstated. And, and most people have never sat down with a financial professional to sit down and yeah. truly do a full needs analysis, identify where they are, where they want to go, and put a comprehensive plan yeah. in place to get them to that destination. Yeah. And, and so that's what I also like about this is you don't have to be making a million dollars a year to actually get help in this because uh, all of us. Zero for it. Yeah, charge, exactly. Other, other companies charge five hundred to twenty five hundred dollars just to do that financial planning process, which is why most people like my, when I was growing up, my, my dad passed away when I was 16. If somebody would have met with my family early on, we would have been totally fine. I mean, it would have been tragic that we lost him, but the family, yeah. we wouldn't have lost our house. We wouldn't, my mom and I wouldn't have lived in a camper shell in the back of a truck. We wouldn't have been homeless, right? Those things wouldn't have happened. Yeah. If someone would have sat down and had this conversation with us and we would have had the right structures in place. Yeah. So the problem was if someone wants to charge me $2,500 to do a financial plan, heck, if we had $2,500, we want to put that into our financial plan, not pay someone to talk about having yeah. a financial plan. Correct, so correct. Our whole model is to take what works for wealthy and build a business that allows us to take that education out to people that would normally never get that education and have the entire toolbox. It's not just having indexed accounts or insurance products. It's 401ks, it's IRAs, it's mutual funds, it's 529 plans. Yeah. Now, there's also the contrast to that if somebody can qualify, there's better accounts we'd recommend. But they yeah. say, no, I still want to just do the 529 plan. Well, of course, we're still going to do that. If the yeah. company still needs a 401k, of course, we'll do, even though we'd recommend as an employee not to fully fund their 401k, there's yeah, better yeah. places to go. But as a company, it makes sense to have a 401k. It's a yeah. thing you have to have to be competitive in the market. As a 401k or a 401k alternative, you yeah. need to have something to be able to attract that talent. Two companies trying to recruit someone to come work for them. One has a 401k or a 401k alternative and one doesn't. Yep. Then the employee, everything else being equal, is going to go towards the one that has that. So you, it's almost like table stakes. You have to have it. So as a company, we have the entire toolbox. Certainly, we're going to help like a Southwest Airlines with their 401k, but then we're also going to help all those employees. Coca-Cola, all 146,000 employees, we do the 401k for Coca-Cola, but then we sit down with all those employees and do their financial plans. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty damn cool then. 
so even if I like a large employer, if I work with a company like Transamerica, I'm also getting that incremental benefit of having my employees actually have financial advisors pegged to their accounts to actually help them. Um, wow, I didn't have that at, at P&G, Berkshire, or uh, Nike, so uh, that's fun. Um, you have an HR person that sets it up that is not even legally allowed to have a securities license. Not a lot. Your HR people cannot give you financial advice, and yet they're the ones setting up all the 401ks. How crazy is that? I mean, just yeah. think about that for 30 seconds. Damn. Wow. Okay. That's interesting. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say we successfully kind of calmed him down. So maybe you have some soothing yeah. words here. Um, but uh, it, any other kind of like takeaways we have? I know we're pretty much coming up on an hour here, and I want to be respectful of your time. Um, so like, again, if I'm thinking about this, we, we went through the the uh, cash flow quadrant of being a, an employee to being a self-employed business owner to a business investor. Um, and like how the wealth and also how the time is dispersed there. We talked about different ways to become a business owner, which was like startups to um, franchising, to getting involved with various platforms. Um, we talked about ways to create multiple streams of revenue while still maintaining your job. It just it creates something from security to abundance. Uh, and that's what the, the all, multiple streams of revenue can do for you. And then we, uh, we highlighted with, in particular, uh, your work with WFG and Transamerica, how you actually don't have to leave your full-time job. You can be like the Southwest Airlines guy who was just WFG part-time, had his license <laughs> pegged, but got the foot in the door for Transamerica to then secure the, the retirement account with them. And now he makes over $300,000 a year just off of that alone. So um, it, it sounds, and then we also, I think you kind of laid it out. It doesn't take too much time, a few weeks, $300 or so to get the, the licensing in place uh, in order to at least have this as a passive play for an in income stream for you, for you to then choose as the insurance owner now of how you want to utilize that to increase your revenue, right? Yeah, yeah. so as a, as a business owner, as a business owner in the financial education space, yeah. you're the person's able to actually now have a license to be able to have these conversations, which again, yeah. you have to have a license to be able to have the conversations yeah. you must diagnose before you prescribe. People ask me all the time, Kevin, why don't you just do a billboard? Why don't you do a billboard that says guarantees, tax-free, ask me, and a phone number, right? Why don't you do a Super Bowl, Super Bowl ad, guarantees, tax-free, ask me, and a phone number? Because you can't. Once you're licensed in financial services, those things would get you unlicensed and in jail and huge fines for doing that. So you have to have individual conversations. So being part-time, someone being part-time allows them to, whether they want to have the conversation or they just want to open the door, hey, I saw it, it looks good, you need to see it, let that person meet with a financial professional. But because you refer them in, have that compensation. And that's how most people start. Most people start sticking their toe in the water. And then when they're making enough money just from the referrals, they're like, after they've seen it, it help a couple people, they're like, Kevin, the software does the heavy lifting. I, I did show and tell in first grade. I learned how to do that. So I think I could do the show and tell on the, the slides that you guys have that takes them into this conversation. And you've got the chefs in the kitchen, so I don't have to be the chef. And, and it, it just, it's an easy baby steps transition into that. So, I mean, but the big takeaways, something. Do something. Have some additional revenue stream. If for no other reason the tax write offs want you that ten thousand dollars a year on average that someone gets in tax deductions, you literally can lose money in your business. If you went and started some other business, like a home house cleaning or window cleaning or some other business you wanted to start, you could not be profitable for four years, never make a dime in your business, and the IRS will still let you take all your tax write offs before they consider it a hobby. <laughs> so do anything, find something that you can do around your schedule as a business owner and get the tax write-offs. And luckily in our business, as soon as somebody's helped one client, they, they, they on, even just putting away $100 a month on a kid's college fund, they're going to make about $600 on doing that. So they're going to offset the cost of their licensing and, and the time they put into it just off their first person that they refer. In most cases, we're going to make sure they make more than their cost. Yeah. So they're net positive at that point. And then anything else they do is just incremental on top of that. But just do some, have something that gives you the tax write off for being a business owner and can create those additional revenue streams. Certainly, we'd love for those people who, again, if you have felonies around money, that's probably not the right conversation. But if you haven't been robbing banks, we'd love to have a conversation with you if you have a heart for helping others. Because that's crucial. They have to have a heart for helping others and yep. a mind for integrity. Do the right thing 100% of the time. 
If you have integrity and a heart for helping others, you can win here. If you don't have those things, you cannot. You will literally fail. You cannot win the long race. I, I like that heart for helping others. I, I think you've told me this one before, but mission before commission. Um, and I know that's where a lot of financial advisors get a bad name is they are only about the commission and not about the mission. Um, so um, I get it. Uh, the more times I have conversations with people like you, the more it reminds me that there's there's more good people out there than bad people in the world. Uh, it's just the bad people seem to get the, the most amount of press. Um, so. They definitely get the most amount of press. The, the gloom and doom that they want to pro pro you know, put out there in the media definitely is more shocking. Let's, let's get the shocking news out there, the shock and awe factor. Um, but there are good people. And you find whatever you're looking for, by the way. If, you're look, if you go to any town, yeah. if you look for the dregs of society in any major city, yeah. you can find people who are you know, doing drugs and right, just, you can find the, the people who are not doing what they yeah. you know, being socially acceptable. But if you look for it, you also find good, hardworking people who want to make a difference, who want to help others. So you find what you're looking for. Yeah, I, and I would encourage everyone on this call to, to at least begin looking for and compare what we do to anything else. You're to a really simple side by side is if you find something else, say, hey, can we compare this side by side and let us show you for the time in what size organization would you have to have? How many clients would you have to help in whatever business that is to reach a certain financial number? Nothing yep. pays like financial services because we're solving a bigger problem. It, if we're helping someone with their kids, right, we're, we're solving a hundred thousand dollars get things we talk about. Many people on their debt, twenty, thirty, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars in debt problem we're solving. For retirement, at least a million dollar problem we're solving to get someone to retirement. So since yeah. we're solving a bigger problem, we just get paid more per client than just about any other industry in the world. Yeah. So I'll put off what we do, the platform that we've created for time in, for low cost, low barrier of entry. And the compensation and also the look in the mirror and feel good about who you are and what you do because you know you're making a dramatic impact on someone's lives yeah at least have, a, have our hat in the ring with whatever else you're looking at so we can compare it side by side yeah no i i mean that makes plenty of sense um so amen to that um and and thank you for that summary there so um, I think this is probably a good place to close then uh as i as i think about what we've covered in the last couple of weeks now uh, we had just like the big highlight of what is an IUL? Uh, and that was kind of eye-opening for a lot of people. Then it was uh, the truth really about a 401k and then like 529 plans and like really what are all these fees? How how can we still make money on our investment with all these fees? And then we closed out today of like if you actually want to become a part-time business owner, uh, what are the, the platforms you can leverage in order to have that part-time status while still maintaining your full-time status if you so choose? Um, any, any other topics we should be hitting in the, in future conversations? Um, absolutely. We haven't really hit on rollovers, old 401ks and IRAs sitting out there. There's definitely some accounts that we need to look at as okay. far as how to help somebody who has some money that's flapping in the breeze right now. Um, market corrections are going to happen. Um, there's some big predictions on some major yeah. corrections happening in the next 12 to 24 months. Let's make sure people are completely protected from those things. Okay. Make sure that there's some ways to leverage those things together. Um, both the index accounts and private pension plans and some other vehicles. And now we can start talking about some of the things we can blend. Um, when you, to eat um, sour cream, like to grab a bowl of sour cream, just eat sour cream, I'm not a fan of that. Um, to drink buttermilk, some people like buttermilk, I'm not a fan of buttermilk. Rosemary and thyme, to just grab them and start chewing on them out of the garden, not a fan of that. But when you blend those together, you get ranch dressing, I love me some ranch dressing. <laughs> I, so there's certain things that by themselves aren't that good, but when you put them together, yeah. you amplify, right? You dramatically improve once you add these things together. So I, I definitely think we should have some conversations. Just some of the different okay. things that are out there that can be blended that really supercharge how fast somebody reaches their goals. I like it. Okay. So I will put that on the agenda for us to get back together here in a, a short time to discuss that. But Kevin, Crew, and I thank you very much um, for this uh, wonderful conversation. Uh, he's getting ready to cry again because, well, he's unfortunately just a little sick kid today, but uh, he'll he'll get out of the uh, the woods soon enough. Uh, but all right, well, Crew, you're a trooper today. Appreciate you hanging in there, Dan. Always good talking. Hey, to you. thank you, thank you, thank you, Kevin. You have a good one. All right. Take care.